Tomas, thanks for speaking with me. Um, so you're one of the organizers of Schrodinger at 75. Can you tell me a little bit about how this conference came about? Well, this is the second um, anniversary conference that has been held uh, in Dublin, hosted by Trinity College Dublin. First one was 25 years ago. Um, I wasn't there because I was seven years old, but we wanted to do the 75th anniversary uh, meeting. The reason I became involved was because soon after joining Trinity as a junior faculty member, uh, I went for coffee with Luke O'Neill. And when you go for coffee with Luke O'Neill, anything's possible because he loves to develop ideas and then to pursue them to, to actuality, to, to deliver on them. And he came up with the idea of expanding on the nature of what he was thinking for the 75th anniversary to include as much neuroscience as possible. And Luke appreciated, even though he's a biochemist, he very much appreciated that the future of biology was largely about the future of mind. Just as in Schrodinger's time, it was about going towards a framework whereby we could start to think about genetics in a way that would allow us to do experiments and then eventually understand the nature of hereditary material. Um, the position we are currently in now is similar to that, but for the brain. And the reason that we're here is for a number of reasons. One is that we haven't quite had the tools to investigate how the brain works. I mean, we've been interested in mind for as long as human civilization has been around. And it's not that suddenly in the early 21st century, we've gotten a good idea about the brain. What's changed is we have the tools to investigate the brain. And soon after Schrodinger gave his original lectures, well, X-ray crystallography was around. The tool molecular biology wasn't there, but biochemistry was well developed. And the tools for doing the initial kinds of experiments that led to the genetic revolution, led to molecular biology, were available at the time. We are, uh, we're at that kind of place in neuroscience now. We can manipulate the brain in ways that previously were unimaginable. We can study the activity of the brain in ways that were previously unimaginable. But I feel like we don't really have a good idea about how to think about making sense of the brain. So how does your research fit into the themes of the conference? Could you tell me a little bit more about the work that you do? My research is focused on memory. Uh, I'm very interested in how memory is stored in the brain. And memory is a kind of information. It's learned information about the world that somehow we store in our brain and is necessary for adaptive behavior of all animals. So understanding memory is a way of gaining insight into what information in the brain could be. But we don't really study memory from an informational perspective in the biology of memory. The biology of memory is a very rich field. It's a very large field. And we know an awful lot about the molecular biology, the cell biology, and the physiology of the processes that are necessary for an animal, for an organism, to engage in learned behavior. But what we're really dealing with is the mechanics around the necessary processes for learning and memory and the mechanisms that are necessary for uh, learning to occur, for recall to occur, and for memory maintenance to occur. What we're not dealing with sufficiently is the question of how our individual memory is stored, how is information actually coded. So we know that somehow it's involving these kind of synaptic mechanisms, somehow it's involving these cells, and somehow all of these different programmed signal transduction pathways with downstream gene expression cascades are essential for processes in memory. But we need to understand what makes one memory different from another, what makes my memory of sitting with you different from my memory of sitting with Luke O'Neill. Because from the biological perspective, from the mechanistic perspective, they are identical. And if I, as a scientist, am to look at what's going on in a mouse brain of, that has one experience versus a brain that has a slightly different experience, the biology would be the same. What we need to understand is the differences, the, the information specificity. And that's why I like for my own research on memory to be as informed by current novel thinking on how we can think about information in the brain. Now, it's been an underlying theme of this conference, Schrodinger at 75, that information uh, is something that must be in the brain and that we can recreate outside of the brain. Artificial intelligence, 
we heard from Murray Shanahan uh, yesterday. We kind of have the view that, and it's sort of an implicit baggage that comes from information theory, formal information theory, which is basically a subfield of computer science, that all information is based on a von Neumann-esque structure, Shannon information, that will basically be looking for ones and zeros in our brain at some kind of synaptic level. And I think that this is a little bit misguided because though that is a very good way of designing a computer, it's not uh, how the computers in our head evolved. They evolved much more slowly, not with the same kind of architecture. And the other thing that I think is clear about the brain is that all the information is intrinsic. And what does that mean? Uh, it means that you don't need an external code or an external reference point to read it. With computer language, you do. You need an external reference point. You need a Rosetta Stone so at some point in the system for it to be usable to you as a user. But the genetic code, which is a type of biological information that we do know, and I think this is very important, if there is one kind of non-von Neumann biological information that we know as a fact exists in nature, it is the genetic code. The crucial thing about the genetic code is that the information is intrinsic to it. So a gene carries with it everything you need to know about it. You don't need to have the triplet code somewhere else in the cell to read the genome. The cell just does it itself because the, genetic, the gene has intrinsic meaning in the context of the cell, and context is, is the crucial thing. Our computers, as we design them, don't need to have context. We give them the rules. But the biological information of genetics, and I think the biological information that is coded in the brain, has meaning because of context. And so in the case of the genetic code, the meaning is the cellular environment, ribosomes and what the cell's function is and everything that leads to effective transcription or translation of that gene. In the case of the brain, I think that it's going to be some kind of interaction of a memory engram with the wider context of the brain, with the other memory engrams there. And it's probably going to be some kind of population effect, and I'm speculating here, of many different pieces of information that have been stored in the brain, some of them from learned experiences, engrams, some of them uh, genetically hardwired engrams, which code for instincts, and that these are going to be competing with each other for expression in what we call consciousness. And that consciousness, or what we call consciousness, is the manifestation of the brain becoming aware of particular active engrams or ingrams at a particular point in time. So at that, by that, I mean that those pieces of information are being expressed and are expressing their intrinsic information in the context of the brain, in the context of the world. So a much more complicated chain of events than the genetic code. But I think that the key issue here is that we need to be thinking in terms of semiotics, in terms of not the code, because a code has a script with an external reference point, is but, a, but a meaning. Metaphor? Yeah, me, meaning rather than code, I think is what I'm trying to say. And I'm really looking forward to Michael Gazaniga's lecture this afternoon, because I think uh, he's going to kind of close the loop in this underlying theme in the meeting. It's come up a lot in the conference about this messiness of biology and how even though you can have these simple systems and codes, you have to think about them in the larger context. With some of the themes that you've programmed and some of the speakers that you've programmed, you're sort of exploring this in lots and of different ways. How did you decide on those themes and those speakers? Well, it was a group effort in, in every respect. Um, we agreed that certain topics had to be covered. We agreed that the future of certain topics had to be covered. Um, for me, everything that we look at in biology, and therefore everything that we would have to look at in a conference about the future of biology, has to be looked at through an evolutionary lens. Everything has to be about evolution. And the evolution of information uh, crucially seems to me to be the common thread that ties in everything from the origin of life to genetics to neuroscience. But when we think about evolution, there is a tendency to always be looking back. And the more and more that I think about evolution of information in biology, it seems to me that we should always be more having our eyes on the future, having our eyes on how things are evolving in a continuous fashion. Uh, par a part of that is to consider 
the evolution of our own species, the survival of our own species. How are we going to evolve under current environmental pressures? How fast are we evolving relative to other species? How can we modulate that with CRISPR gene editing, which we talked about, or with brain editing tools? Is it possible for our culture to evolve to the point where we can make it something that we can replicate outside of ourselves? Uh, and one of the things that I find very exciting about Daniel Dennett's work, for example, is that he shows us that culture is a product of biology. We've created it, and we have found a way of instilling thousands of years more of culture into a single individual in one generation. That's a remarkable achievement. And it's, and it's also clear that if we accumulate 10,000 more years of culture, we will be able to instill the best parts of that on a human individual in one generation. So in that sense, besides our biological evolution, if we think of our cultural evolution as a continuum of our biology, which it is because it's based on our brain structures, then we are in a position to evolve even more rapidly than we have been doing. And if we take a purely informational view of how we are uh, evolving, about information being the crucial thing that makes us us, why can't we replicate that in artificial intelligence? Now, the kind of artificial intelligence we heard about from Murray Shanahan is very inspiring, and it's obviously starting to become modeled uh, neuroscience and modeled on how the brain works where, where possible. But I think um, as work from people like Saul Cato and others develops and we really, really understand how simple brains have been engineered through evolution and therefore by extension how more complex brains like ours have been built, there will be no reason why we can't create artificial intelligence that is based on the same types of structures and instincts, maybe we can remove some of the bad instincts, uh, as us. And what, we, what would result is essentially um, artificial versions of us um, that would be able to obviously evolve much more quickly than us, that would be more capable of leaving the Earth and more capable of surviving on the Earth regardless of what we are doing to it. Um, so I think, though I mean, I know this sounds like bordering, bordering on science fiction, but in the long term it seems to me that that's the real value in artificial intelligence is that it would be a form of cultural evolution that would allow uh, us to escape the trappings and inefficiencies and problems of our biology, but take the important aspects of ourselves, of our brains and of our minds and of our culture into a more secure and more stable and more evolvable uh, form. Um, but going back to the present day, you asked me about my own science, and I think that um, that's how we need to look at memory. And I think that learning and memory um, in an animal's lifetime or in the education of a single individual is an extension of development. Um, I was recently at a development conference last week, and I started my lecture by saying I'm not a development researcher. I'm a memory researcher. And then I corrected myself and said, that's actually an oxymoron because um, every memory researcher is a developmental researcher and learning is just a small extension on development or engrams with the development of an, of an embryo of an individual exactly. of the brain of an organ exactly again. memories build on our instincts our instincts are and our brain are a product of our development and development is essentially an evolutionary process and so when thinking about the evolution of information it's not just about um, generational timescales, it's not just about population, it's not just about artificial intelligence, it's about how we ourselves are learning and educating ourselves in our own lifetime. And understanding that, I think, is, is crucial for, for understanding how to manage ourselves. So this, all of these things came together in um, organizing this conference. And I think that the reason that uh, we invited Daniel Dennett as the keynote speaker was because I think he's largely responsible for giving us uh, parts of the kind of perspective that I and others have been talking about here, which is the, a forward-looking view of evolution and a holistic way of looking at biology and an alternative way of looking at information theory. 
So when I was speaking to Daniel Dunnett just before his lecture, he goes, wow, it's interesting. All of the speakers today have, have in some shape or in some form of other kind of foreshadowed my talk. Uh, and I said, yes, that's, you did that in a sense. I mean, and that's what's happening. Um, he didn't do it, of course. It's more like the termite colony that he described. There was, there's no one person who results that causes that architecture emerges because you had enough people with certain tastes and with certain inclinations that were pushing for different things. We agonized over every single speaker that we invited. Every single speaker was intensely debated. Um, we had to be very careful about keeping it realistically about the future of biology. Um, Luke O'Neill remarked that 25 years ago, all the speakers were white, male, and probably above 45. And that didn't seem strange back then, because, you know, it was 1993. But um, today, we made sure to have a lot of young speakers. And the young speakers we have are not just any typical young scientists. All of the young scientists that we invited to speak are absolutely world leading in their field. And I have every confidence they're going to produce some of the most interesting science in the coming 10 to 20 years. What do you hope the legacy of the conference will be? To the people attending, to the people speaking, to anyone who sort of watches those talks, how would you like this conference to shape science over the next 25 years? What I would like to see from this is that the conference um, gets a lot of young people to think about science uh, not as a profession, not as a career choice, but as a creative work that is about addressing questions, to think broadly about the questions that they're most curious about, um, to identify their own directions in that research, even if it's not popular or conventional, and to find ways of doing it. Um, I think it's wonderful that science has, has exploded in the last 20, 30 years since the last Schrodinger meeting. But as a result of that, it has become more and more like an industry with a set way of doing things. Everyone's concerned with learning X techniques, publishing X papers, getting X grants, and career progression. And that's all fine and that's all necessary. But um, I hope that the conference inspires uh, younger scientists to think about the big questions at the heart of biology and to engage with them in the future. Well, congratulations on the conference and thanks for speaking with me. Thanks, John.